Hello and welcome to the 45th episode of Tailoring in Conversation. My name is Reza and in this series I'll be talking to tailors, business owners, cloth merchants and other industry participants from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. My guest for today is Chris Modo. Chris is a menswear stylist based in London and has been working for companies such as Thomas Pink, Eden Ravenscroft and Chester Barry to name a few. Now, as someone who's been on and around Salvaro for a few decades, I'd like to talk to Chris about his views on heritage brands, style, the purpose of it, and tailoring. So without further ado, let's go. Chris Modo, thank you for making the time. Uh, I've got a a long list of topics that I'd like to cover with you. Uh, But first of all, I would think it's a good place to first begin with your background. For for those who don't know you or, or haven't heard of you or haven't seen your work, um, who are you? Where did you start? Uh, what's your relation to tailoring? And uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, I've been in menswear for just over 30 years. I come from very much a, a retail background. Mm-hmm. So I start, I don't have any, tra- I've had no formal qualifications in tailoring fashion or indeed anything. Mm-hmm. So I started on the shop floor in Selfridges back in the early 90s. Um, and then from there, I progressed into a company called Thomas Pink. It was fairly new at the time, got into management quite young. And then I sort of worked in, and then from that stage, obviously for Thomas Pink, mm-hmm. we were quite a formal company. So I was always having my suits made by sort of independent made to measure tailors. I had a couple bespoke, I think, I had a few bespoke suits. Always loved my suits, loved clothes, loved that sort of English style the 90s was quite quite a cool time to be into that look as well um worked for a few companies ended up as a salesman on savile row for a company called 40 savile row in the late 90s which is very very interesting um and then i went to a company called eden ravenscroft Mm -hmm. in 2000 so i went from the newest tailor on Mm -hmm. savile row to a company that existed before savile row was even built. I mean, it was much mm-hmm. older, 300 year heritage. And mm-hmm. then that was when I got off the shop floor. So I got off the shop floor in my sort of early thirties and became head of, um, head of buying for tailoring. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've also had a lot of him. I was also very much involved in made to measure and made to orders and stock specials. That mm-hmm. was like my niche for about four or five years. And it was actually my knowledge of made to measure that gave me by my then boss, the skills to go into buying and designing. Mm-hmm. So I did that for up until I was 40, so about almost 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I made the leap back to Savile Row, if even Moment Croft is considered Savile Row, that's another discussion, um, to a company called Chester Barry, mm-hmm. which was what probably most people know me from because that was when the internet was up there and we had Instagram and we were doing, and it was a lot more of a visible role very, very exciting time. I did that for five or six years. Worked with Edward Sexton as a tailoring consultant for three mm-hmm. years, which was out of this world. A great, great experience. As everyone who's worked with Edward will tell you. Um, and then they let me go in 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, and while I was out of work, I thought, well, looking for another role, similar role, I started doing a few bits just to keep some money coming in rather than just look for a job. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing bits now for five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So So I've done done a lot of menswear, lots of different roles, but very much in the old fashioned way of starting Mm -hmm. on the shop floor, being a salesman. Yeah, and I think what, what makes your case also interesting is that you've got to see a lot of companies from different backgrounds in different mm. eras and also uh, in different positions. So uh, one of the things you said is that you've worked for the oldest and the and the newest tailoring companies on Savile Row. So when you, when you were working there, did you notice a severe difference? Did you really, could you tell that this is an old company? Uh, versus this is a new company or, or was it just the style and the products that they oh, were no, delivering? Oh, no, it was, it was. I mean, when I, when I, I went to, I was headhunted to go for work for 40 Savile Row, mm-hmm. which was, I think, 98. And it was when that side of, it was when the the west side of the street, it was a brand new building. Mm-hmm. I think it was, so it was, it was opened up 
and we were, and Forty Savile Row it was owned by a company called the Savile Row Shirt Company that's still right. still making shirts for other brands and themselves. New concept of making accessible made to measure. So so we were I think we were under five hundred pounds. Right, right. So right. when when Savaro was ooh, I'm trying to think back in, I think late nineties, a, 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 I think Huntsman were probably around two thousand, mm-hmm. but it, it was around the fifteen hundred pound mark for a, a Savaro suit in the late nineties, which nowadays sounds so, so cheap. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, it does. It like, does. That's like, a pair, that's like a pair of trousers now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and we came in at four fifty five hundred. And we right. were using a company. It was all made to measure, make, made in uh, France by the Vestra system, which was mm-hmm. which was fascinating to learn. It wasn't it wasn't the I didn't particularly like the styling of the product, but it was a fantastic measuring system. I mean, it was really, mm-hmm. really, really good. Um, mm-hmm. But I just didn't like the style of the suit. I didn't like the lapel shape. I didn't like the shoulder mm-hmm. lines. I didn't like the lapel shape. So no matter how well it fitted, I was always disappointed with the suits. Yeah. So then, I think no, that was interesting. Because a lot of people, if being a new ta- being a new brand on Savile Row, um, selling non-bespoke garments, you're never mm-hmm. going to be welcomed with open arms. Right. Right. Particularly- so, what was the difference, would you say, between the older companies? Like, what were the markers of the older companies versus the the very new companies? Um, well, we were doing things differently. I think we made. A, I think our offer was very was very obvious. We were a much more mm-hmm. open shop. Yeah, yeah. We look, right. like, we look, we look like a shop, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and we mm-hmm. did things quite radical, like open Saturdays. Right. So we, right, we were right. the only shop open on Saturday, mm-hmm. which was amazing because <laughs> back in those days, pre-internet wasn't pre-internet, but before people did Google searches, yeah. people would say, "I need a new suit for my wedding." Mm-hmm. I will. I've heard of Savile Row. I found it in the map. I will go to Savile Row and I will find a tailor and have a suit made. Mm-hmm. And you see these people walking up and down, looking really confused. And then suddenly come into your shop and go, "Why is everyone closed?" <laughs> and we say, "Because they don't want. They don't want. To, they don't. We want to sell you a suit, and they don't." And that was like, "Ha, oh. oh, a bit, 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 bit cheeky." And we just yeah. took so much business on a Saturday. Right, right, right. Interesting. And that. So oh. we were, and, and then we just making it very simple. You know, we had no house style. We had no background. Mm. We had no baggage. It was. Mm-hmm. Which is three young guys. We're all, I think the three salesmen were. We didn't feel. I didn't feel young at the time, but we're all in our twenties. Mm. None of us had a very strong. I was the only one with any made-to-measure background, so I did it for Roderick Charles for six mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. It was just we, we were just salesmen. Right, 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 right. So, did you feel at any point uh, when you were working on Forty Savile Row mm-hmm. that? Um, the concept of Savile Row was something that the company could kind of like benefit from because oh, it yeah. already had. Or did yeah, you but- think that maybe this is a risk because we may not be accepted because we don't fall in the category of bespoke? Uh, no. With like, hmm. no, I mean, uh, the key to it is we were very, it was very much a customer focused. Mm-hmm. So we never, I, I don't think anybody went to Savile Row to be part of the community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We had a bes- we had a bespoke option. We actually did have a relationship with a with Richard Payne, who I've not heard of for a few years, who was a mm-hmm. genuine handmade mm-hmm. bespoke tailor. So if someone wanted bespoke, but nobody came to us looking for bespoke. Or mm-hmm. and we were, in, the, in the beginning, we made it very clear that what we were selling was mm-hmm. distinct to the the fifteen hundred pound suits. Yeah, we were yeah. selling a suit of five hundred pounds. Mm-hmm. And we would just say, no, it's not handmade, but mm-hmm. we're using the latest technology. Yeah. Um, and we're using the same fabrics, mm-hmm. same buttons, the same linings. So what you can feel and touch will be the same. Mm-hmm. What you can't mm-hmm. see is different. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we, were, yeah. we were quicker as well. We were turning suits around in three weeks, which, again, for a lot of guys mm-hmm. who are new to Savile Row, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, was, it, was, it was what people wanted. It was basically giving people what they wanted. Right, right. Yeah, I can. Now I can imagine that maybe someone who's uh, a diehard Savile Row fan listening to this, um, oh. yeah, saying like, "Oh, look at this uh, company taking advantage are, of the, of yeah. the name of Savile Row." You know, it's it's these kind of companies that are the reason why Savile Row isn't like the old days. How how do you view that? Do you think that uh, the the name Savile Row 
was one of the reasons why you guys did have a good Course. business at oh, the time? Oh, completely. I mean, the, 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 the parent company was called the Savile Row Company. Right. And they, were, they were based, I think they still are based on Coach and Horses Yard. So they were, mm -hmm. they were in the vicinity. So mm -hmm. they had, they had a, a geographical right to call themselves Savile mm -hmm. Row. Yeah. Um, and they wanted, and they had this concept of doing a shop on Savile Row because obviously the new retail units. And I mm -hmm. guess the landlords wanted retailers, and they, wanted, they were designed for retail, yeah. not for yeah. tailoring. They were, they were too small. They were, the, the downstairs, mm -hmm. there's no natural light in the basement, which is different mm -hmm. to the other side of the street. They, yes. wanted, they wanted retailers. Mm -hmm. So it was retail tailoring. And like, um, we never asked him what, you know, and it was what people wanted. I guess coming out of the 90s, you had, you had companies like, Mm -hmm. Hackett, Thomas Pink, mm -hmm. Charles, no, Charles Stewart, but we hadn't even really, was still any mail order then. But you look at the, the, how successful people like Hackett were and Thomas Pink, mm -hmm. there, were, there was an appetite for more accessible classic style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a company like Forty Savoro, where you worked at the time, um, did have positive influences on the traditional tailors in some ways that they maybe thought, hey, it's actually good to have a shop like this because it brings people to the street. Or... Yeah, I tell you, um, it, well, th it was noticed by, I think, then, that was what I think. so when we opened up, I'm mm -hmm. trying to think other brands that came along. Alexandra came along, which was a similar concept. Mm -hmm. um, Hackett opened up, mm -hmm. which always made me laugh when Hackett came back a few years ago. Yes. That, so this is, this, you've been here before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was like this is. It was, I think they had they had a shop there in '99, right. and then Eden Ravenscroft opened up in '99 in the uh, on Vigo on the Burns and Gardens. Yeah, um, and I think they came to Savile Row, offering mm -hmm. ready to wear and bespoke. Mm -hmm. But they they saw what we were doing. I think the, the the general manager of Eden Ravenscroft saw what we were doing mm -hmm. with this middle ground, thinking there's that this there's something here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People, okay, some people did come to Savile Row. No, most people that came to us knew mm -hmm. what they were getting. Mm -hmm. And if they want, they, we, we weren't really, get, we weren't getting bespoke customers coming to us, ex mm -hmm. pool customers. We weren't getting ex mm -hmm. uh, Huntsman customers. We were getting guys that were shopping in the high street. They were, buy, they were right. probably ex Shigo Boss, ex Hackett customers. That's what we were getting. I see, I see. Well, that, so that does so make sense. It was a journey. And, and mm -hmm. probably if you like tailoring and you enjoyed the experience, mm -hmm. I expect a lot of those people then moved on to shit. Let's call them proper tailors, get real bespoke. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. So I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what, what you think the meaning of a brand is. And I'd like to get into that topic by first asking you, since we are talking about Savile Row, Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the reason that Savile Row became Savile Row as a brand? And what do you think makes or made Savile Row special? Um, Savile Row is a brand. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have a love-hate relationship with, with Savile Row. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very much a Victorian institution. Mm -hmm. And I think it still has some of that Victorian attitude about itself. Mm -hmm. It ain't that old. I, mm -hmm. I, I get interviewed a lot about, oh, Savile Row, Savile Row, it's been here forever. No, it hasn't. It's been here for mm -hmm. what, 150 years, you know? And in, mm -hmm. and, in the, and in the concept of London, which is an ancient city, mm -hmm. it isn't that old. Right. And tailoring existed before mm -hmm. Savile Row, and no mm -hmm. one talks about where you know, no one laments about our oh, Miss Aldrich tailoring, right? Which was the which, no Aldrich was where tailoring was before Savile Row. Mm -hmm. No one talks about it, mm -hmm. so I think it, it's like a hub. It's not a particularly pretty street. Mm -hmm. I think so. You know, I agree with that most definitely. I mean, I came from German Street. Yeah, to, uh, German Street is a beautiful street. Mm -hmm. German Street, you can. It's a shopping street, and I don't think Savile yeah. Row. I think I think now it's becoming more of a shopping street. Mm -hmm. I think what CAD have done and the service have done is making it more of a shopping street. Right. But it was it was a destination. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't browsable. Right. Um, so, but there, but there are some around Savile Row in Savile Row and around Savile Row, some amazing top end brilliant tailors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if Savile Row never existed, there would still be amazing tailors in London. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
can you, can you give an example of of what makes you see Savaro as an as a Victorian institution? I think so. I think the no, the, the facades of the shops gives mm-hmm. you that look, mm-hmm. and I just feel from my experience, it's a little the service is a bit obsequious sometimes, mm-hmm. and it has a little bit stiff, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's a bit like going to an old fashioned English hotel. And if you go to a luxury hotel now, if you go to a top end restaurant, mm-hmm. the service has moved on. The food's right. still amazing. But yeah. you don't get waiters in stiff shirts and wing collars and long aprons. Mm-hmm. I the, see, I see what you mean. And I just feel that the, a, a lot of the Savaro is was certainly when I was there in the nineties, mm-hmm. was still a little bit a little bit pompous. Right. A little, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't feel it was engaging or, mm-hmm. and it was, and they were, they were charging luxury price, it charges luxury prices, mm-hmm. but I don't think a bespoke suit isn't necessarily a luxury process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I've, I've some, sometimes I've said that uh, a bespoke suit is luxury for the client, but misery for the tailor <laughs> uh, in, in, in some say, say, yeah. cases. Uh, so, so, um, what what do you think made Savile Row so seem so important or or be so important uh, at a given time? Because you know it, I, it wasn't special yeah. when it first it popped up, no. but after a time, how it did developed it into some, How yeah. did Savile Row become special? Yeah, I guess um, it was probably the Americans. I guess it was probably all that mm-hmm. new money. I, I guess if you look think about it. After World War Two, you had right. a lot. You know, when the dollar was so strong, you had a lot of middle class Americans in Savile Row mm-hmm. that were buying suits, mm-hmm. these fantastic suits they couldn't get in America. And mm-hmm. I guess it was that sort of that that international trade where it was it was right. it was that it was it was the overseas customer. I don't think Savile Row was ever aimed at. I think it was obviously the aristocracy shop there. Sure. Obviously, you had, you had the military links. Yeah. I think it was probably the overseas thing. It was part of the London experience of coming to London mm-hmm. and, and, and having this idea. But no, it's, it's true. How, how did Savile Row become Savile Row? Mm-hmm. Well, I, um, I'd like to... I, I, guess, like it's like, I guess it's like, it's like um, you know, it's, it's a bit like Harley Street. Right. And, you know, it's just, it, it, became, it had a good name. It's a, it's a good sounding name. It's a name that works. Yes, that is very true. Yes, it, it does. It's a great name. If it was, if it was, yeah, it, it's just a great name, and it yeah. suit. It, oh yeah, Savile just sounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, not, it does. not 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 if there is a Jimmy involved. Though. No, it's just, well, thought, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that was always that was it. I wasn't. It was, I felt really funny. There's a cloth merch, a cloth milk called Savile Clifford. Right. I mean, when if you, go, I, yeah. try, I remember trying to Google them once because I, I need their phone number. Yeah. I just couldn't. It was like the fifth page when I found it. It was just what a, what an unfortunate name to have. Yeah, Clifford. yeah, yeah. But Clifford so, Street. Okay. So, so yeah, okay. Um, now, clearly, we we are talking about the things that uh, you know make a brand a brand. We say Savaro had a good yeah. name, the exposure to the to to like mm-hmm. the bigger market, etc. What do you think is a brand? What is the essence of a brand's ha- brand? How would you describe a brand? A brand and, is okay. Mm-hmm. A brand is a set of emotions that a mm-hmm. word will, a word or a logo will make you feel before mm-hmm. you know anything about the questions. It's some no. It's it, it sets for. It, it has principles and it's an emotion. It's an emotional thing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Savoir has you know it's, you have an emotional response to it. Right, right. And if you right. see if you see the Nike link logo, you know you know what it stands for. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if I saw the the Gucci logo, I know what that's about. I see the Gucci colours. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think yeah. So it, it, it it's an, it's an emotional attachment to a word mm-hmm. or a brand or a phrase mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. that you just know what it stands for. That's 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 a good definition to to have. So. Based on that definition, how do you see the relevancy of, for example, heritage brands in general? I mean, there is there is obviously a certain type of person with a given te- temperament mm-hmm. that has a love for old things in general. Yeah. Yeah. But we also have something innate in us that 
just loves, for example, ancient wisdom or ancient stories mm. or, you know, grandmother's recipes are more oh, authentic yeah. than, than our sister's recipes. So, no, sure. so where do you think the relevancy of heritage brands uh, comes to play when we are talking about tailoring and, and uh, handcrafts in general? Okay, that's, that's a really good question. I think you, you put one of your questions to me was, uh, is heritage baggage? Yes. And I think it can be. I've worked for, as I've said before, I've worked for startups mm -hmm. and I've worked for companies that have got too much heritage. Eden Ravenscroft mm -hmm. established 1689, allegedly. Mm -hmm. um, it was just too much. It's how do you make that relevant? Mm -hmm. Nobody comes, nobody, nobody comes for the shop for, I'm, a, I'm looking for a suit of 19, that 1730s look. You know, anything over 100 years... It's just, it's pre-suit, you know, we didn't really have this, the lounge suits only, I mean, you probably know more than I do, but probably the lounge suit, late 19th century, early 20th. Yeah, I mean, after so, the frock coat, that's when it really became kind of like popular. So It yeah. became popular you know, for, for, yeah. for casual wear, it wasn't, wasn't it, but it didn't become really acceptable until well yeah. after the World War One. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think it can be different. And also, if you're... So if you're going into a brand that's that old, mm -hmm. but is the person working? For certain, no, that person that hasn't been there since 1689. He's only been there two years. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're you're buying a new suit. You might be looking at something. Yes. I, I, I tell you, you get in the shoe trade. I, I look on German Street. Mm -hmm. There was, I mean, not now, but we had there was mm -hmm. a shoe shop in German Street. All the bespoke samples were pre-war. And off yeah. the record, they used to tell you in the pub we couldn't make them like that anymore. They're beautiful. Yeah. So you are buying into a, a, a brand, but actually, what are you buying? You're not, you know, you're buying. Mm -hmm. It's an it's a name, and what you're and what you're buying has no relevance to 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 the heritage. It's, right. It's, so when you say there is too much heritage, uh, what you mean is something like the the mismatch between the time of today and the person yeah. who is standing in the shop is not from yeah. that era, no. but. The things the that they are selling is from that uh, era. Or they might be selling a product which is complete. You know, you, you go into a, a tailor, a tailoring firm which is say fifty years old, but the yeah. suit has no. There's nothing in that suit that has any relevance for that brand. It's just a generic, mm -hmm. ready-made suit mm -hmm. that could have could have been any label. Right, right. So now I can imagine someone who is a, a, a the fierce defender of of heritage brands say, "Well, hold on." Um, it is those old things that make a heritage brand a heritage brand. If it would get rid of those things or just put them in a corner, then it would have to rebrand so severely to uh, walk no, along with the times. You just, How would you no, say that? No, I mean, I work, I work with heritage brands. I work with, um, um, as a stylist, mm -hmm. I work with a company, I, I'm the, I'm, I do photographic styling, a yeah. knitwear company called Alan Payne. Mm -hmm. Now they have... Oh, I should, I'm going to get in trouble now. Uh, uh, over a hundred years heritage. Mm -hmm. They invented the cricket sweater. Right. So it's, it's part of what they do, but then not, and it's always a part of the story. They'll always mm -hmm. do a great cricket sweater, but their cricket yeah. sweater they do now is for the modern market. They're not I selling see. vintage clothing and they get mm -hmm. it just right. The heritage is there. So mm -hmm. you know that they, but, and it comes across because they've got a hundred years of buying the best yarns and they know where to shop for the yarns. They know how to mm -hmm. make things. So they've mm -hmm. got all the, the archive and they're using it. Mm -hmm. But what they haven't done is to be a, an Ed, they're, they're not an Edwardian knitwear supplier. So they, they, they get it. I think Alan Payne just get it really, really nicely. that They're a heritage brand, mm -hmm. but they are, but the clothing they do is relevant for how we want to dress today. And I think uh, looking at some heritage brands mm -hmm. is that they, they they hang on to the golden era too much and they, they're sort of hoping they want to dress like 1930s. Mm -hmm. Which, let's face it, I mean, we all love them. I love them. Everyone loves them. I yeah. want to say, I love the 1930s. The 1930s just looks incredible. It probably was. It wasn't. It was a horrible time. Yeah. But looking back at old photographs, if you, you know, yeah. it, it, everyone, everybody looked like Adam Flusser says. Yeah. Everyone looks amazing. It wasn't just the film stars and the royalty that did. Mm. Mm -hmm. Your granddad looks great. Yeah, the granddad on the holiday looks great. Everyone yeah. just looks so cool, and that's I think it's really true. So, was, oh, 
wasn't it wasn't Edward the Eighth so well dressed? Yeah, but everybody was. You know, he had yeah. the most money in a time when everyone just looked. It was such a style. In a, to our modern eyes, it looks yeah. so serious. But trying to recreate that like, this is the perfect suit, and we're only going to do it, and we've perfected it. Mm-hmm. I just feel it becomes less relevant, and, we, and it's mm-hmm. the, the, we our lifestyles have changed significantly since the nineteen thirties. Right. So, so it I seems to me it, that. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, the best use uh, of of the heritage that they have is to use the story, yeah, the historical story, but not the product. Is that yeah. some something? Yeah, but all use elements. If the product's still good, fantastic, still do it. But also, mm-hmm. everything they do was new once. Mm-hmm. So I think I think there's too, I think the trouble with I say heritage brands on Savile Row mm-hmm. is there's too much tied to the lounge suit. And Savile Row and the suit mm-hmm. are intrinsically linked. And I think yes. that's the problem Savile Row is having. And I've been criticised recently for saying in the press, the suit is dead. Mm-hmm. And I agree with people. Mm-hmm. I don't believe it's dead. I was saying it at the mm-hmm. time for to get a reaction. Mm-hmm. But, the, but also the poor arguments I was getting against it. No mm-hmm. one could really defend it. And mm-hmm. I say, well, the, Savile, well, the suit will always be here because Savile Row invented the suit. I was like, mm, kind mm-hmm. of did, maybe not. But I said, but mm-hmm. Savile Row's older than the suit. What was it making before suits? Suits are new ones. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't, I just, I don't believe that we, we are Savile Row. We make lounge suits and we'll, we'll always make lounge suits. The lounge suit will always be here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you th- do you see that c- clearly what you're saying is true? Everything evolves and some things will replace Yes. Well, new things will replace oh. the older things. That's yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, and when you say the suit is dead, the arguments that I hear mm-hmm. are very similar, almost identical mm-hmm. to if you read. I mean, you've probably got if you read the old Taylor and Cutter. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. Taylor and Cutter was so anti lounge suit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was saying, well, these lounge suits are okay for the weekend, but the, the, yeah. gent- the gentleman will never give up the frock coat. Yeah, 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 because true. no, if you make a suit without a waist seam, it's not proper tailoring. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that, and then if, you, and if we talk about nowadays about well, mm-hmm. actually, I'm for business now. I'm going to wear a field coat. I'm going to wear a very soft jacket yeah. instead of a lounge suit. Nah, no, you can't do mm-hmm. that. That's not so. No, it, it's it's looking back and seeing that the the the, the suit was new once. Mm-hmm. It wasn't open arms loved by Savaro. I mean, mm-hmm. as soon as they started making them, realized how much easier it was to make the body coats. They must have loved it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, huh. So when you say that the suit is dead, it, uh, I well, would interpret. Yes. Well, yeah, yes. not yet, not yet completely, but to some extent, the suit is it's dead. dead. No, it is in the sense that. Okay, it, so do you it, mean? Do you mean that it's dead because we have entered an era where the psychological? Uh, preferences of people have shifted the demands exactly. of, of dressing that's what Completely. you mean. Yeah. yeah i think what well, i think the difference is is that the suit in the 20th century and the suit was to me mm-hmm. the iconic garment of, of western 20th century dress it right. was the most yes. success it, it started this it, it means so many different things to so many different people and it started the century as informal dress mm-hmm. and it ended the century as formal wear it went from being casual to formal yeah um uh, so that I always use the argument is that if my grandfather went mm-hmm. to the pub on a Sunday in a suit, that was mm-hmm. accepted normal. If he didn't wear a suit, it was it was it was everyday dress. The suit yes. was your it was what you wore for everything. You know, no one would question it. If I if I if I put a suit on mm-hmm. outside of zone one and I see somebody I know, it's where are you going? Have yeah. you got, are, you go, are you going to a wedding? Have you got yeah. a job interview? Are you, you know, it, it's now become a it's now become occasion dress. So yeah, the for suit, many countries as well. For yeah, many yeah. countries, yeah. So the so that we have to understand that the lounge suit is now formal dress, and it's and it's not your everyday attire. Whereas for my grandfather, my grandfather mm-hmm. worked in the greengrocers, mm-hmm. but you know, if you look at post-war, mm-hmm. men wore suits. It was you know the de mob suit. I think the de mob suit had a big big impact on the psychological importance of the suit. Yeah. Because it was considered, it was in a way classless, apart from obviously the subtle details. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. 
So yeah, so but it, it, nowadays you need a reason to wear a suit, unless of course you're yeah. in the industry or you're a fan. But that's it, it's mm. a it's a choice. I think from that point of view, I still have a few suits and I enjoy wearing them. But I never I vote unless it's a well. When do you have to wear a suit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because you know you look at a lot of uh, photos uh, in the in the older magazines and. Mm. People would just wear suits when they were at home. Yes. And so they're sitting watching the television in a suit. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it makes me think, what do you think the everyday garment has become today? Well, what do you th- well the- I think, I think um, jeans overtook them. Jeans overtook them, for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, oh, that, but again... Mm-hmm. Jeans are older. I mean, jeans are fantastic. Jeans were the the a nineteenth century tailoring. Yeah, yeah. I've had again. This is something I always find really funny. But jeans have got this really. Jeans have got. I mean, jeans and denim as a brand mm-hmm. are amazing because mm-hmm. they are so old fashioned. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they still have this idea of being slightly modern and subversive. Yeah, because of their, yeah. their workwear connections. Mm-hmm. But if you look mm-hmm. at a pair of jeans. They're probably closer to a 19th century pair of bespoke trousers than they would know. If you went to a 19th century tailor and showed them a pair mm-hmm. of modern jeans yeah. and a pair of modern sartorial trousers, he'd yeah. recognize the jeans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No waistbands, no front creases. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, the part, you know, it, it was, it was, it was, they were, they were, they were in the style of the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, what, uh, Chris, what do you think? What do you think that, since we're talking about style as well a little bit, what mm. do you think is, first of all, how, how do you personally define style? And then what do you think is its purpose? Style is to me, it's communication. It's communication. Can, complete. Style is communication. It's how, you know, if, if you see somebody, it's how you can communicate to somebody about who you are mm-hmm. before, you, before you're introduced, before you even speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's a way of showing respect. It's mm-hmm. a sh- it's a way of being subversive. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so yeah, it's it's to me it's very very important. It's it can be it's a sign of manners, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but also the complete opposite. So you can you can you can you can upset people with it. You can get all sorts of reactions. Yes, yes, that's true. So based on that, if 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 you look at the general society, let's say in uh, general, well. It's funny because London is so different than other other mm. cities. But let, let's take London, for example. If you look at the average men's style, woman's style uh, in London, what do you think the, uh, what do you think uh, is the message that they're communicating through the, their the, styles? That clothing is not important. I'm, I'm talking about men now. I think I don't think I don't think clothing lady, is think not important. Men, for, for the average man, clothes how they dress. Is no is nowhere nearly as important as it was twenty years ago. Why do you think that is? Because they have far more things. More, there's much more things to spend your money on. I think. Mm. Um, I always think back to my Chester Barry days mm-hmm. and, and the old Chester Barry customer. And your Chester right. Barry customer was Middle England, so mm-hmm. he he knew what Savile Row was, but it wasn't for him. Mm-hmm. And he would go to his local Austin Reed. Mm-hmm. And buy a Chester Barry suit, a Stevens Brothers shirt, some churchy shoes, because mm-hmm. um, that was that's how he fitted in, mm-hmm. um, and it was important. But nowadays, people and that would have been a big investment for him. He would have invested in it, mm-hmm. he'd have looked after it, and he'd have updated it when it needed to be. But nowadays, I think we've got so much more to spend our disposable income on. We've got technology. Well. You, you never had a phone, so where's that money coming from? What's he, what we, what the money we spend on our laptops and our tech, what mm-hmm. on what, what we're not spending money on? So mm-hmm. there's and then the watches. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I had this conversation with a friend the other day. Is that a four-figure watch is now considered normal in London? Mm-hmm. Well, people buying five hundred pound suits, four hundred pound watches. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you know a thousand pound watch was for movie stars and footballers. Now right. it's for shop assistants. So I think mm. your clothing has become less and less important and there's far more things. No, we've, got, we've got better restaurants than we had 20 years ago. So eating out was more interesting. Mm-hmm. Obviously pre-COVID it was different, but we, we can travel far more. Mm-hmm. So there's so much more to spend your mm-hmm. money on that people are spending less and less at their disposable. The typical man is spending mm-hmm. less and less on his, on his wardrobe. 
And mm-hmm. I did some research on this for a company a few years ago. Um, his business wardrobe is the least important thing. I think I think 30 years ago, your biggest clothing expenditure would be your work mm-hmm. wardrobe. Mm-hmm. And it was when I started work when I was 18 in a bank. Yeah. I spent virtually a half a month's salary on my clothes. So you, you had to work a month. <laughs> to pay for my to, to 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 wear the clothes to earn more money it's ridiculous right but nowadays people won't spend money on you know, i don't think it's that, as important it's a it's a lifestyle choice and the general people and uh, what well, i look around at, at very affluent people in my area where i live mm-hmm. um and they've got the expensive watches and the cars and their holidays but clothing is not as important to them mm-hmm. so do you think that the fact that there is a lot more to spend on Mm. has also decreased how one would want to present themselves oh yeah i think i think yeah i think if you if you you can't go i don't think you can go back and i think i had this argument conversation during covid or everyone will want to dress up after covid Mm -hmm. no they want to i think having nice clothes is always a lovely thing putting on clothes that fit well and look good on you and comfortable to wear it's Mm -hmm. lovely it's a lovely feeling just being well dressed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um But it has to be relevant for the for the modern day, and I I don't think people the typical man mm-hmm. doesn't want to go back to the 1930s, mm-hmm. unless it's a Great Gatsby party. Right, 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 right. It, it becomes mm-hmm. cosplay. Yes, I I it, it it has felt weird to sometimes see, for example, uh, an older person bringing in their son. And introducing their son to the tailor, yeah, uh, in a very formal way, and th- that although it's very nice for the company, it just observing that just felt a little odd. Yes, and and, and I thought, hey, I don't see this happen anywhere, but now I'm seeing this. Ha- it feels so old fashioned. Yeah, even though it, you know, uh, the company would benefit from it, and it's just good to have people wearing suits. So, do you do you would you say that? Um, how long do you give the suit? To disappear completely or turn into a very occasional uh, dress. I would, I would say. So I, I would say now it's formal wear. I say the suit is now formal wear. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's no mm-hmm. longer, it's no longer a native dress. Right, right, right. If you had to do a man in the street, you know, a man in, the, in Oxford Street walking down, he's no, is he wearing a suit? No. Mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. I wanted to, if I wanted to fit into how everyone's dressing around me, I don't wear a suit. So the suit is now formal wear. So. Mm-hmm. The suit is like black tie, yeah, and then these white and white tie is you know mm. is 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 that sort of thing? Yeah, well, I don't know. It's 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 not not very frequently that you see people going to white tie events no. anyway. So it's it's very very niche. Okay, so um, now we 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 have talked about style and and, and brands and all of that. So. What do you think that when when in a given trade, and we we're talking about the tailoring trade in general, yeah. when in a given trade, one particular or or a few brands become really large, mm-hmm. such as Savile Row turned into a brand without being one one entity, for example. Yes. What sort of responsibility, if any, do you think they have towards their industry, especially if it's a crafts industry where you know that. It's not like tech, you know, 20 startups yeah. a, a month. You know, it's like, it's a very slow industry. Uh, what sort of, do you think there is any responsibility? If so, what sort of responsibility do those larger brands have? I think there's definitely a, there's, there's definitely a responsibility to the workforce. No, certainly. I mm-hmm. mean, for because that's just the right thing to do. I think any company, you know, anyone who employs somebody else does, mm-hmm. so with, with, does so with responsibility. I think employees have rights. I, I'm very strong. I believe that very strongly. Mm-hmm. Um, but also from a purely cynical point of view, you mm-hmm. need to protect it. If that's if that's your workforce, that's your machinery. Mm-hmm. You need you need you need to need to look after them. So there's def- there's definitely a responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the British mm-hmm. have put as much back into the trade as the Italians. I do a lot of work. I've done a lot of work with Italy over the last 20 years, mm-hmm. making clothes and fabrics and trim in Italy. And it looks like a lot more money gets invested in Italy. 
Do you mean from a governmental level or they, just they, individual the, investors? The, 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 the Brits often complain, oh, it's from the government, it's from the, it's from the European community. I, I don't know where it comes from, but it's thirsty. If you look at, I mean, if you look at how much money the British cloth industry made in World mm -hmm. War One. Yeah, I mean, it's just must be. Yeah. They just made a killing. Okay. War is good. Yeah, is has well, been I, good for. Yeah, I mean, to think um, for the because from having to do these collections. Yeah. So basically, they turned the Louvre over to three cuffs. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just no. The economy was scale amazing, and then they had they, they've all closed down. They never they, they never competed in the Italians in the sixties. Updated post-war and put into mm -hmm. these new looms and much more technological looms and now their industry is just light years ahead mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. british textile industry which i'm a fan of and they do some, I, there's some lovely lovely mills out there yeah it's far more like a cottage industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i just i so they, i think they, and you would think that in savile row there would have been someone would have invested in a modern workshops mm -hmm. rather than still making on Carnaby Street, fifth floors, tiny yeah. little offices. You know, you think yeah, all, yeah. That, all, all that money going into that suit. Yeah. <laughs> you would True. expect these are nothing like the work. When I go to North Vista and go to the tailoring workshops, they are light and open and air conditioned and clean and mm -hmm. lovely. Yeah. And I, and I don't think that's where, you know, Savile Row was all very much this very old fashioned facade for the customer. Yeah. But there were the suits made in the best conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, definitely. I, I can tell you that it's <laughs> by, by far and large, the conditions are, uh, uh, in general, they're not up to standards of other industries. No. no. You know, if you go to a Primark, I mean, I'm, I may get ahead of myself, yeah. but. If you go to a Primark factory or a Zara factory, as as you know, not not every company, first of all, no, no. Has, has has child labor or whatsoever. But even those places where they have mass scale productions, most of them have very good air conditioning, good lighting, oh, yeah. good tools, all of that. It's not like a small two by two workshop oh, no, where there no. is no sunlight. Oh, no. I mean, that was always the ironic thing was I used to when I worked for Chester Barry, I also had to do um, the diffusion line. Mm -hmm. which was called Chester by Chester Barry, which was right. a huge, I think it was a million pound turnover a year for, for the John Lewis partnership. Right. So I had to do, and, to, and they, they wanted to retail this suit at 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. So we had to make it in China and Vietnam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I went to some of the factories and we used to send people out there who are specialist people to do, um, to check their up to standards, you know, mm -hmm. do a complete audit. And we, they would say, this isn't right. There's you no, know, uh, it was really strict before you would get an order. Mm -hmm. So to be completely transparent and John Lewis wouldn't place an order unless you had all the right paperwork. Mm -hmm. And we always just joke, if we did, if we made them in South Road, it wouldn't get passed. You would, you would never, you would never do it. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah. no one expects it for South Road. And I just think that's, you know, why hasn't anybody mm -hmm. put together a proper, proper clean workshops? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there is there is another aspect, and, and I guess this is the part that I uh, I wouldn't say sympathize to justify, but sympathize to, for, to understand, which is if, if you have a business which is founded on Savile Row mm -hmm. and like you say, you know, there, the suits aren't cheap, but then looking at how much is left over from, from, from the selling price of that suit when there is a lot of staff to pay and there is a lot of bills oh, no, to no. pay. No, that's, so, that's, no, the you're unfortunate right. part, the no. art, unfortunate part is they, it's very difficult for them to detach from their Savile Row brand and say, oh, for example, you know, DJ Skinner is now in, in, in Soho. That, that just sounds weird, no, you know? No, it's like, no, you, can, you can still make, you can still make there. You, you don't have to, yeah. I mean, maybe it was, yeah, you can. You, you don't. I mean, how many Savile Row suits mm -hmm. never leave Savile Row? How many go out? I mean, they do because I see. I used to see them. You know, yeah, people yeah. coming and collecting stuff all day long. Yes, that that's true. That's so true. So if it, if it goes off, I mean, I don't. I, I if I went to a Savile Row tailor and I, it was I was measured on Savile Row. But really, mm -hmm. if I went to a Savile Row tailor, if I got if I like the suit, it fits me, I'd be happy. 
Yeah. That's, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah. And I think the customers don't care if it's sold in Soho or it's no. sold in Italy. Yeah. Although most of them, uh, well, some of them are, are more and more kind of like aware of, hey, who's making this? Where is this made? Because that yeah. becomes the selling point, right? Hey, this is not mass produced. You can, yeah. you, we can, we well, can bring you to the tailor who made it kind of thing. I think that's absolutely right. I think, I think it's the meeting the coat maker now is, is, a, is a, I mean, you never saw the coat maker, did you? Yeah, true. I mean, some firms, you, you're lucky to see the cut, so it was all through salesmen yeah, yeah. and under. It was, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to exactly. see the customer. What's wrong with it? No, it was yeah. it was a very regimented thing. I yes, think that's yeah. yeah. If I had a bespoke suit made, of course I want to see the coat maker. Yeah, yeah. How much yeah. nicer would the suit be? How many less fittings would I have? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you probably would have better memories of the process as well, you know. Unless so, yeah. the, the coat maker is a total disappointment. Uh, but then, <laughs> but then, but coat makers are coat makers, and they're not. And yeah. They don't fit the prescription of what. Yes. A tailor looks like I've come to Savile Row <laughs> to see a tailor, and you see a coat maker. Go, oh, sorry, it's the wrong Savile Row. I mean, this, is what, this is what coat makers look like. Yeah, that's yeah, why. Yeah. yeah, that's why. I mean, when I was back my full Savile Row days, I wore a three-piece chalk striped suit, polished apron, yeah. green shoes, double cuff shirt, and a tape measure around my neck. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I ticked the box of what a tailor should look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was given the suit, and I talked to you know, I was, I knew my stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I was a, a tailor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they yeah. actually met, but I think they should. It's great. They are the ones that actually make the garments. So if 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 we would kind of like bring that back into the context of being a brand, you know, uh, mm -hmm. matching an image that evokes some sort of an emotion in your mind when yeah. you think of it. Um, you talked uh, pre be before this interview. You you talked to me about the importance of local tailors. Oh, yeah. and, and that it's not just one big brand, but it's like, hey, there is a whole industry out there. You have villages, Completely. you have towns. So what, what's yeah. your take on that? I really think that when we talk about tailoring, you might get into, you know, I, I, I used to write a lot and I used to talk about tailoring. It's straight on to Savile Row. Mm. So we must protect Savile Row. Savile Row needs protecting. And I'm like, Savile Row is a commercial street in a very busy area. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, you know, if it can't charge the right price, Mm -hmm. for what customers want mm -hmm. you know it's like anything if you, if you if you don't rip people off and give people what they want they will come back for more yeah but the competition's getting harder yeah um but i really miss forget you know we'll, we'll, we'll have road be here in 50 years time i don't know mm -hmm. but i miss the good local tailor when i grew up in the 70s mm -hmm. high streets had tailors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some were quite smart some were a bit scruffy yeah, and I yeah. just think I, I want to see a return to that. And mm -hmm. I think Savile Row does get a little bit prickly about what, I mean, the, we haven't talked about what is bespoke. I know you've mm -hmm. covered this a lot. I've spent probably a year of my life, probably every company I've worked in, trying to define when does, what is, when does made to measure and bespoke, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. um, and actually... If, if we stop focusing on that and just giving customers what they really, really want mm -hmm. and, and not being so jealous of anybody outside of Savile Row, and I, I want to see a return to it. I miss, I think there's a, definitely a, a missing, uh, for the good alteration tailor, I think alteration tailors are so maligned and mm -hmm. so disrespected, but alteration tailors are amazing. They're the ones that actually finally make what you want, what you really want. They yeah. have to listen to customers. Yeah, yeah. And I just, and I just think... Um, that every every town should have a great alteration town. They should be they should be respected and mm -hmm. part of the community. And then Savile Row yes. is on top of that. What mm -hmm. I don't want Savile Row to become is like a little Amish community of people that live in the nineteen thirties. <laughs> it is. It's like this is it. Nineteen thirty six. This is the most stylish era. We don't need to get any way beyond that. It stops. I get you. I get you. So. Um... And, and tailoring know, doesn't, and it's not just suits. I mean, tailor, I, know, I love, I love what Lee Marsh is doing with his with his like, bomber jackets. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. fantastic. You know, take that skill of tailoring of taking. I mean, what you guys do. I, I mean, although I'm could be a little bit rude about Savile Row and the services and that, but yeah. But anyway, I've, I've worked with tailors, and what they can do is take something two dimensional, mm 
mm-hmm. and make it three dimensional. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. an, an uh, it's, a, it's an amazing mixture of art and science. Mm-hmm. That I never mm-hmm. fully understand. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm intrigued, but I know what I like and I know what to ask for. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's amazing. But that can be a, I, I, it should be everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think that's I think if you have good tailors locally. Mm-hmm. You've, you've then got a journey to Savile Row. I wouldn't want to go to Savile Row. Like you say, bringing the sun in, you've, yeah. missed out on the, you've missed out on the journey. Yeah, 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 true. You know, you've, you've got to have the... You know, also, you, you, I mean, I've not had a bespoke suit this century. I've not, my last bespoke suit was 1996. That's a while back. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I was four. <laughs> Um, I keep meaning to have one. I keep thinking I've, I've never had a Savile Row bespoke suit. And I think every mm-hmm. time I've I've spoken to a few tailors and they're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to make it for you. Yeah. I yeah, said, because yeah. I showed them, I said, well, this is, I had this made in a factory in Italy and I tell them the price I paid for it. And they're like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. That's the trouble. That's the thing. Yeah, and again, yeah. I think um, bespoke tailors, if they can work with factories, the knowledge mm-hmm. you can share and what you can see together Mm-hmm, is amazing mm-hmm. and, and again i think also when you talk to bespoke, bespoke tailors why is your suit better oh it's not fused and few, what's wrong with a fused suit oh it bubbles yeah, well, yeah. really yeah, I'm not, yeah. I've, I've been selling fused suits for 20 years i've only seen one delamination they don't they don't mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. modern fusing is not like okay you're talking about the 1960s fusing mm-hmm. that was really well, it was quite you know it was a bit crude but mm-hmm. the fusing presses they use now and, and, and the improvement in dry cleaning, they don't. So I think mm-hmm. that's the trouble Snap Road's facing is that ready to wear suits are getting better and better. Yeah. But it's also As, a very weak argument because you could, you, could, you could say, well, pure wool suffers from moths, hand oh, stitching yeah. cut, comes loose. Yeah. Uh, and and a lot of times, if the craftsman is not in a good mood, you probably are not going to have you're not going to have the best uh, quality available. No, I mean, I, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't see a reason why a bubble would be worse than a hand stitching that that falls off. You know. No, for sure. And also, I mean, again, um, is again, I, I when you read about uh, what makes a bespoke suit better than a made to measure suit. The fabric's better. The fabric's the same. Fabric is yeah, it is the same. It is the same. Yeah. I mean, the and, difference it, and is, even yeah. the even the high armholes are getting higher on made to measures. So so. Oh no no! I mean, you got to think. I mean, that, that was the, the pleasure I had. I mean, it was it was it was a pleasure in the end. It was hard mm-hmm. working with Edward Sexton and mm-hmm. going to a factory and yeah. then putting his amazing ridiculous mm-hmm. amount of knowledge into ready to wear and making factories do things we don't do that. Mm-hmm. So the amount of fullness you put in the back seam mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. specifically in the centre was incredible. Yeah. Yeah, factories yeah. don't do that. Be, be taught them how to do that. And it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, the shape we put in the chest. Mm-hmm. And again, so the whole idea of um, if it's ready made, it, it's mm-hmm. flat. Ours one. Yeah. Ours had a chest. Because yeah. we put, yeah. we're, we're putting, he was using his bespoke knowledge of darts mm-hmm. into the mm-hmm. chest piece. I mean, that was it. Mm-hmm. it was, and then he was so, he was on the collar construction and the collar mm-hmm. fits. He was just, no, looks at the grading. So yeah, mm-hmm. it was. You know, one of the one of the things uh, you could tell me what you think about this. One of the things that I've thought about is that the problem that um, bespoke tailors, handcraft tailors, yeah. um, created for themselves was that when when re- ready to wear be- began to become popular and made to measure became a thing, yeah. they had to react in some way to defend themselves, right? Hmm. And and most of it is marketing tactics. And I think the, the the mistake that they made at the time, which then compounded to today, was that instead of thinking ahead and be like, okay, let's imagine that all the suits are made the same. Yeah. Let's let's assume that ready to wear one day can make exactly what we make. What does it mean to then be a tailor at that time? Yeah. But in, and 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 what you kind of that is this is the conclusion that I have uh, derived. It's literally your relationship with the client and the experience of making that suit. So even the end product becomes somewhat irrelevant. But what they did instead was focus on technical aspects. And that's where the arguments of it bubbles and this is done yeah. by hand, so it's softer and this and that. What do you think of that? Do you think you're that that's... Ab- you're uh, absolutely right. It, it's far too... Um, it's far too inward looking and not about the customer. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And if you say, I, I think when this would probably go back to the 2000s and the Savile Row SRB and then the SRA and mm-hmm. what makes a Savile Row suit? Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was like the 20 points of a Savile Row and lots of technical things. Right. Most of which I didn't understand. But I thought, like, and then a few of them, like, that's crap. But trousers have to be half lined. I went, no, not my, not my trouser makers, I know. And yeah. there's lots of little, it was like, really? Yeah. And it's like, so no mention of how you treat the customer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so internal. Yeah. And it's not, you're absolutely right. It's about the experience and mm-hmm. giving people what they want. And that's the, that's what, you know, that's what you get. You go to a tailor mm-hmm. because you will give me exactly what you want. Yeah. 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 And, 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 if, and even mm-hmm. if exactly what I want is you telling me how to dress. Yes. Yeah. It's not yeah. saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to design my own suit. I'm coming to, I'm kind of huntsman because I love that suit in the window. I want you to, I want to look like the huntsman look. So tell me, you know, guide me through this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, yeah. but that's what that's but that's what the customer wants. That's in, yeah. uh, so that's what I think um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where the tailoring industry has been so that's not bespoke. That's not bespoke. They call themselves bespoke, but yeah. And rather than making other things bad, just say no. Ready mm-hmm. bespoke. No, ready so good. Ready made is fantastic. Made yeah. to measure can be even better. But I'm going to yeah. give you something even better rather than being rude about it. Yeah, 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 yeah and it yeah, just yeah. leaves it, it comes negative. Yeah. And the, the most unfortunate thing is also that the term bespoke is not specific enough. You know, I, I could place an order now at some some place where they would make something for me, yeah. uh, factory made, uh, and it still would be bespoke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so so that's a bit unfortunate. And, and it's but, a funny it's a funny it's a funny old word anyway. It's a, it's it's, a, it's not a great yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, well, I'm very curious to see how that all develops. Now, what do you think that a local tailors can do to be more respected, first of all, but also okay. recognized as true skilled artisans who do do things that has the same effect as you know having you know something it's made for you? Service, absolute service. The trouble with these tailors is the service is appalling. Yeah, they all and, look like very dodgy shops where yeah. money laundering it takes place. And you can't, and you can't. There's, 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 never, there's never a nice fitting room. If you had a good illustration, say, of a nice fitting room, somewhere you can mm-hmm. go in and you can take what you wear off and hang it up. Yeah. But it's usually in the dry cleaners, and there's like a curtain that doesn't really cover you, and it's, it's just <laughs> not. And there's, and there's hard, and the mirror is not the right size. Yeah. And it, no, okay. you, you go in there with. But so I was just thinking. There used to be a tailor on Lower Sloan Street, for first mm-hmm. alterations, mm-hmm. and they gave an old-fashioned bespoke service for alterations. So you went in there, you had a mm-hmm. salesman dressed beautifully in a yeah. bespoke suit, mm-hmm. and, it, and he would talk you through it, and then you would go to a fitting room, you'd come out, and they'd mm-hmm. pin you properly. Right. And then it was great because I was only a shop assistant at the time, mm-hmm. so if I picked up a, a vintage suit in a charity shop, I'd, take it, I'd have it cleaned, then take it there, and they would mm-hmm. treat the product with respect mm-hmm. and they would charge you double what you would maybe locally, but you'd, you'd go there for the service. And it wasn't necessarily quick. You'd have to wait a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just think that's actually going to a, a tailor and having something made. What you It's the touch points from the customer. Mm-hmm. It's going in there, having somewhere comfortable to try it on, having mm-hmm. the proper advice, having that proper communication, feel like you've been listened to. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's the trouble. The alteration tailors, and as clothing is becoming more and more expensive, because you know, you, you know replacing clothes has become harder. People yeah. are looking, and also understand you can do like good alteration tailors can do anything. Yeah, you can customize yeah. clothes. You know, it yeah. was people. The customers, there's a perception that bespoke tailors can make anything, which you just mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can do anything. Like, yeah, we, we can do anything, <laughs> but I'm particularly good at making this anything. Yeah. Um, but there's so much you can do on, on alterations you know, that mm-hmm. customers aren't aware of that you can take, you know, they know you can yeah. shorten the sleeves. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can, you can, you know, people don't think about changing buttons. They can take the waist in. You can, you can mm-hmm. alter the neckline. You can alter the collars. There's so much you can, yeah. you know, good alterations are, are yeah, a wonderful yeah. stepping stone into, in, into learning about bespoke. And yeah. then, then thinking, actually, I, I get the difference of this. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they're just not, not treated in the same respect. Mm-hmm. At all, so you think the South Road tailors don't get respect? You know, think of that local alteration tailor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, 
let's do speed round, Chris. I've uh, got a list of things that I've written during our conversation. Okay. And uh, you tell me in one word the first thing that comes up your mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's see how this goes. So, um, well, the alteration tailor. Undervalued. Undervalued. Consultancy. Means that means too many things. Means to, okay. This I wrote this because you were talking about the consultancy you did for some companies in for for their styling and, and things like that. Okay, so well, it's also my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, okay. I, I say you know, so again, but I, I say I'm a consultant. I actually, in, I, I I call myself a consultant. I actually end up doing the work. I actually, for the company, I don't I don't consult. I actually do it for them and say this okay, is what you need okay, to do. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, it's a, all right. Okay, okay. Um, Made to measure. Uh, uh, opportunities. Opportunities. Heritage. Baggage. <laughs> Saddle row. Victorian. Victorian. Um, most influential person? My father. The garment that replaces the suit? That's an expensive question, isn't it? The coat. The jacket. The jacket. The jacket. The, the, jacket. the, jacket. Okay, the separate okay. jacket. The separate jacket. All right. Okay. Okay. The tailored jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Fav favorite cigar. Uh, Partagas D4. Right. Um, if you had a magic wand and you could change three things about the tailoring industry, what would those okay. three things be? Okay. What would I do? I would like it to be. Like I said, we've touched on before. Mm -hmm. I'd like it to be um, more universal. I think ta I'd like to see the, the tailoring industry in every market town, in mm -hmm. every high street. I'd like, I like. I miss the old city tailoring. City tailoring had a whole, had its own language mm -hmm. and heritage and style mm -hmm. that's just kind of been swamped by a Savile Row. And I want to, so I want it to be this. I think in Italy alone, mm -hmm. you've got um, what two thousand independent tailors. Mm -hmm. And we've got a hundred, hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. So I'd mm -hmm. like to have it, and then, and then, mm -hmm. you've got this amazing, interesting range of artisans, different tastes and styles, mm -hmm. and then Savile Row can just sit on top of that. But the right. moment it's it, it's it, it's it's nothing to sit on. It, it's the best of what. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the most difficult thing about being a stylist. <sighs> Finding work, no. Um, <laughs> um, uh, no, it's the hard thing is that is that it's not. A, uh, it, it's it's what actually is my skill. I mean, you mm -hmm. can say you're a tailor because you, you, I can cut out a suit and I can make a, a make a fabric. Yeah. What I have no qualifications of being a stylist. I just mm -hmm. can do it, and I so mm -hmm. it's and actually, what is my skill? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can, you know. It, Lucky if it's formal work, I can tie a tie, I can tie a bow tie, I know mm -hmm. which way cufflinks go in, and I know the technical mm -hmm. things. But if I'm just styling a, a sweatshirt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's just my taste. So right. again, it's it's that the hardest thing about being a stylist is that mm -hmm. what actually do you do? It's convincing people what actually you do as a profession that people will pay for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it's justifying to other people that sometimes it can be quite well paid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what, what, do, what do you actually do? You know, someone... Yeah. You know, the person that can, the person that put a handkerchief in the top pocket of a suit gets mm -hmm. paid more than the person that probably put the pocket in. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking okay. about that. I'm, I'm, it's not really selling my job really well, but it's very important because it, it's that hanky in the top pocket yeah. that sells the suit. So it, it's yeah, marketing. Yeah. I, I the, the the reason people will pay me is that if mm. I if I style their products, they mm. sell better. Simple yeah. as it. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that does make sense. Yeah, and then. Last but not least, okay. Chris Modo. Yes. That's the one you need to give me a word on. 
Chris Modo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Chris Modo. God, what am I about this week? <laughs> That's a show. I have a, port, I'm a, port, a portfolio. I'm a portfolio. <laughs> Uh, you're a I portfolio. Am, I'm this a portfolio. Is... <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because I do so many, I do so many different things, and mm-hmm. obviously, yeah, there's, the, there's what I put on Instagram, and there's what I do for a living. And obviously, yeah. styling is. I mean, the great thing about being a stylist is that it's very, it's, it's the most Instagram friendly job in the world. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. you're making stuff look pretty, and if you can't make it, you know, so you, you yeah. obviously a lot of stuff I have to do is under the radar because obviously. If you're pay, if someone's paying you to do some styling yes. and you put the images out first, you've kind of hang on, yeah. this, we've paid you to do this. And so, <laughs> uh, it's diff- I do other, I do other things like mm-hmm. range plans and size mm-hmm. scales and markers mm-hmm. um, and then product productions with factories and deliver mm-hmm. make sure deliveries and stuff like that. So I do. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's a portfolio, a portfolio men's work career. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm about, and I guess am I a brand? No. You know what I told you, Chris. I I, I thought it was instead of Chris Modu, it was Chris Modu, yeah. and Chris Modu definitely sounds like a brand. Absolutely. Okay, in that case, I'm gonna <laughs> go back onto Instagram and say, actually, I've been told that I'm Modu. Yeah, Chris Modu, Chris Modu. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be ChrisModu.com, and yeah, I'll become yeah. a brand. I don't I don't know what I'll sell. I've I've got enough connections. I'll subscribe. <laughs> You buy anything. You can do some alterations. I, I, did want, I did actually think about doing an alteration, um, a premium alteration service. But again, mm-hmm. I, that's, that's employing other people. And the trouble yeah. is, though, is that what actually, it's a concept and an idea. Mm-hmm. But what, what actually can I do? And this you can actually do the alteration. But I still think mm-hmm. that's definitely a, a, for some entrepreneur out there. Because yeah, you've, yeah. so, you've, you've, you've got empty high streets. Mm-hmm. Well, well, someone did tell me that... Um, the best way to get the the newer generation interested in in tailoring bespoke tailoring is to show them the joy of having something altered in the first oh, yeah. place oh oh no but so many people don't know i mean i, I was always aware of it you know, just going to the going to the local dry clean and having the sleeve shortened yeah yeah, yeah is yeah, a, yeah, is yeah. A, it's a game changer it's just suddenly yeah and then you, you 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 notice it and then yeah and then you, yeah. you don't know you know and then just having your trousers Having the cut, mm. having the turn up on your trousers a little bit deeper, and it's just yeah, yeah. No, no, if you, no, you're absolutely right. Next, so if you want to buy a suit, buy a mm-hmm. suit and then go to it, and then take it to an alterations tailor. Don't rely on the shop selling it to you because they're not gonna, you won't get the same service. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that, that's part of the journey, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm all of, I'm all a big part of that. And I think it's where tailoring mm-hmm. will survive. I mean, it could happen. It could happen. Mm-hmm. The analogy I've used a lot is barbering. Back right. in, if you look at London in the 90s, if I wanted to get a proper wet shave, mm-hmm. there was probably four or five shops I could go to. Yes, yes. I can get a wet shave anywhere now mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Well, I can get a wet shave in my local village. You know, it's yeah. it's easy. Yeah. But the people selling at the top are still mm-hmm. completely booked up. I can't, if I want to get a, one in True Fane Hill, I have to book two weeks in advance. Wow. So the fact it's, and I said to them, I said, well, I love I love St James's barbering. You know, he works in the West End, loves that thing. Is it have you found that having all these new barbers now doing things like prop wet shaves and traditional mm-hmm. haircuts has it impacted on the top end? I said no, it's more popular. Mm-hmm. So again, tailoring should be exactly the same. Don't be so don't, don't see these, any new tailors opening up as competition. It just means there's a bigger mm-hmm. industry for yeah. Stanford to be the best of, and there will always be there will always be a market for the best. On that note, Chris, thank you very much. It's for been a this pleasure, interview. absolute pleasure talking to you. Yes, I've learned a lot and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. And that was Chris. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to see more of Chris or you want to get in touch with him, check out the link to his Instagram page in the description of this video. If you have any thoughts, questions or comments, let us know in the comment section. And I hope to see you again in the next episode. Until then, bye bye.